Hi folks and welcome to the Meaningful Money Podcast. This is session number 316. This is the podcast dedicated to helping you put your finances in order. My name is Pete Matthew and I'm going to share with you everything you need to know and everything you need to do to secure your financial future. I'm here to help you make sense of money. Hello, hello. Great to have you with me. Welcome back. Now, I get asked at least once a week, uh, usually on email, about how to become a financial advisor, which uh, surprises me still. But um, for ages, I've thought that what I need to do is to sit down and sort of write the definitive blog post uh, so that in future, when people ask me that, I can just send them to this episode. Um, So obviously, rather than just a blog post, I thought it would become a podcast. For those of you that have no intention ever of becoming a financial advisor, and there will be far more of you than there are of the people who are considering it, hopefully what today will give you is something of an insight as to what it takes to become an advisor, and will give you some insight about how to choose the good ones, should you ever need to speak to an advisor. Okay, so today I'm going to give you everything you need to know and everything you need to do if you are considering becoming an advisor, but I think it will help everybody. After the main body of the show, I'll be announcing what we're going to be talking about over the next couple of weeks before season 14 really kicks in. So stay tuned for that at the end. Before that, though, remember this podcast is brought to you with the help of my friends at Seven Investment Management. They've been helping me out here since 2011, and I'm super grateful to them for doing that. I really couldn't have built it to what it is uh, today without them. So please do check out what they're up to. They're at 7im.co.uk. That's the number 7im.co.uk. Now, I just want to take two seconds out, well, maybe 40, to just sort of acknowledge the fact uh, the chief executive officer of 7IM, a gentleman called Tom Sheridan, uh, has announced his retirement in the week that I'm recording this. So I wanted to just mark that and just honor a man who is a giant in the profession, who, along with his business partner, Justin Urquhart Stewart, has built a business uh, with a culture and an ethos which is rare in the city. Uh, a firm where it's considered a privilege to look after clients' money rather than just an income stream, right? So that is true at every level of the company. Uh, They have built uh, a company where everybody considers it a privilege to serve their customers, and I think that's really unusual. It's been a joy to watch. We've been involved with Seven Investment Management uh, for a very long time since there was about 50 of them, and there's now over 250 <laughs> uh, employees there. So, Tom, just wanted to uh, say thank you for all your input into me, your mentorship and friendship of me over the last, jeepers, how long? Nearly nearly 10 years, certainly nine years. And uh, just to say, have a great retirement. You richly deserve it, my friend. So uh, just wanted to say that right at the start here. Now, let's crack on. I found it extremely encouraging that people, so many people, ask me about how to become an advisor. Many of them tell me that I've sort of evangelized for the profession for so many years now that I make it sound attractive. Maybe it's just brainwashing, I don't know. Now, I do love what I do, notwithstanding the occasional thing that sends me off on on a rant. See session number 270 for that, Uh, one example of it. Anyway, uh, there's lots of things, other things that I could rant about that I don't, I should say. Um, But it's a great job. It's a fantastic role, really rewarding on many levels and uh, satisfying. Ultimately, it's a people business, not a money business. Uh, Get into that in a bit. But um, it's not an easy role to get into, certainly not as easy as it used to be. And that's both a good and a bad thing, I think. So loads to cover today. So I'm not going to go reviews afterwards uh, at the end. Uh, But all the notes and links, and there's quite a lot of them today, they are at the show notes, which is the only link you need to remember, meaningfulmoney.tv slash session 316, meaningfulmoney.tv slash session 316. Without further ado, let's have a look at what you need to know first. (coughs) Nearly crashed my own jingle. Not nearly, actually did. So the first thing you need to know is that becoming a financial advisor is difficult. Sorry to start on a negative, but uh, we uh, like to speak the truth here. When I became an advisor, which was in 1998, so 21 years ago. (laughs) Jeepers, I feel old. But when I became an advisor, I followed the sort of classic career path at the time. And it is a career path that had served the industry very well up to that point. I joined an insurance company's direct sales force. And in my case, that was the Co-op Insurance Society or the CIS. And we would go door to door 
to existing customers though we're not sort of knocking you're not cold calling but door to door to existing customers collecting life insurance premiums very often in cash door to door but i would also collect car and house insurance renewals things like that and i had a four week round a week b week c week and d week and i would collect premiums in cash i would mark people's books then bring the premiums into the office for an accounting every couple of weeks it's amazing really when i think about it i used to walk around you know some pretty ropey parts of south wales with like 1500 quid in cash in my pocket amazing really um now these days hardly any insurance companies have their own sales force as commission as a means of advisors being paid has gradually been replaced by fees which are paid directly by clients the insurance companies as well as the banks and building societies they just couldn't make advice work in that world I once heard that there used to be 300,000 people in the UK who called themselves financial advisors, for which you can just read insurance salespeople very often. Now, there are now about 30,000 people using the title of financial advisor, and even those that don't all really, I I don't think, qualify for that term. Um, So you can figure that it used to be 300,000, now it's around about 30,000. Opportunities to getting into this job have quite literally been decimated, Okay. Now, the benefit of the old route into the profession was that my qualifications, such as they were at the time, were all paid for by the company. I remember going on seven, count them, seven residential courses in, my ho- in hotels in my first year in the industry. Uh, the CIS paid for it all. I passed the exams easily because we would have a week's intensive training before sitting the exam. Uh, they weren't challenging exams either, really, at the time. Uh, but the training was great. Fantastic training residential hotels spent a lot of time in jacuzzis in hotels in the first year Uh, a lot of that time with my good colleague roger weeks who's now my business partner here at jackson so we got to know each other very well in those early years um now there are a few insurance companies now in 2019 experimenting if you like with creating their own direct sales forces again but it's really early days but certainly the route that i took into the profession through an insurance company or for many of us through a bank or building society that route is now essentially closed to all intents and purposes okay so it is difficult now the second thing you need to know is so you need to understand the qualification framework so when i passed my exams back in 1998-99 that qualification was called the financial planning certificate right which It's a little bit odd because there was essentially no element of financial planning in the true sense in the curriculum. Instead, it was a basic but thorough grounding in all the various uh, products available that UK advisors could use to help their clients, as well, of course, the UK tax system within which those products operated. So now these days, the qualifications have moved on somewhat. And essentially, you've got qualities at four levels. You've got level two, which is called award level, which is great for maybe new starter administrators in financial services. So maybe you want to get a job as an administrator in a financial advice firm. That level two award level would be a good place to start. Then you have level three, which is certificate level. And that's ideal for those looking to develop perhaps more into technical roles, you know, such as senior administrators, junior para planner roles a little bit more on these sort of terms in a minute okay level four is called diploma level and that's the minimum standard for client facing advisors if you want to actually sit in front of a client and advise them you must have the diploma level and then you've got level six uh, which is usually called advanced diploma level now i reckon that should be and eventually will be the minimum standard for advisors essentially that's degree level qualification okay i don't think it'll be the standard for a while yet but i hope that it will become so eventually easy for me to say because i already have it (laughs) um now it isn't necessary to be actually working in the job to sit and pass these exams you can just take them and learn self-study and pass the exams without doing a day's work in financial services but obviously it helps if you're on the job while you're learning Now, there are a few providers of these qualifications. The main three are the Chartered Insurance Institute, the CII, the Chartered Institute for Securities and Investment, the CISI, and the London Institute for Banking and Finance, the LIBF. So I've linked to the qualification pages to all those three main providers 
in the show notes. There are some others, but those are definitely the main three. You obviously need a good grasp of English uh, and maths to be a financial advisor. You certainly don't need to be able to do complex algebra, which is really good because that is the reason I failed my electronics degree. Could not do the advanced maths needed. So you need to have a pretty good grasp of percentages <laughs> and you know future value of money, compounding, that sort of stuff. Obviously, a lot of the mathematical heavy lifting is done by software these days, but you need to have a grasp of it. So a good grasp of English so that you can communicate both spoken and in written form and a good grasp of maths, but you don't need, you know, to be a maths professor to be able to do this job, which is really good. Um, so that's the sort of qualification framework. Third thing you need to know is that there are all kinds of different roles in the financial advice process these days. The role actually of financial advisor, client facing, is just one among many moving parts in your typical financial advice business. So starting at the bottom, you have administrators. Now, I only say this is the bottom in terms of barrier to entry, certainly not in terms of benefit to a practice. My administrators here at Jackson are absolutely invaluable. <laughs> if they left, the advisors would be sitting around looking at each other thinking, okay, how does this work? <laughs> we have no idea. So administrators are absolutely invaluable for the smooth running, really, of any practice of any size. I know here at Jackson's we'd be absolutely scuppered without them. Um, I'm not just saying that just in case they listen, because they, they don't, they hear enough of me anyway. Um, so an administrator will have all kinds of duties. Um, they'll deal with day-to-day -day queries, obviously, that come in from clients, raise these queries with the advisors and with the providers of financial products. Um, they will help prepare annual reviews, prepare files for new clients, manage the whole onboarding process, answer the phone, filing, photocopying, all the necessary stuff that keeps the business running. Generally, anything that doesn't require the input of a financially qualified person is handled by the admin team, all right? So once you've achieved some level of financial services qualification, so you understand the theory and the practice of financial advising, then the role of para planner can open up to you. Para planners are qualified individuals who may or may not have direct client contact. They usually have direct input into the advice process itself, though. Very often, a para planner will undertake research uh, to look into a client's existing arrangements and proposed new solutions. They will very often write the recommendation reports that are presented to clients to back up the advice being given. Uh, crucially, they will often, or certainly they should, challenge the advisor with whom they are working. So they act as a sort of check and balance to make sure that the advice being given is the best it can be. Often power planners are more qualified and even more technically minded than the advisors that they're working with. That's a really important point. Power planning is high caliber, high impact role in the financial advice process, and it's a worthy career choice in itself. It doesn't just need to be a stepping stone to advisor role okay it is a noble calling in its own right um, and there is a real dearth of power planners by the way so if it's something you're considering if you have a mind for technical stuff um, there's potentially <clears throat> excuse me a very bright career path ahead for you now advisors themselves they are the client facing individuals primarily they are responsible for the advice that they give to their clients and they are usually the point people uh, in the relationship with the client. Generally, they are the ones who know the clients best. Not always, but they should be. Um, so it's very much relationship management and responsibility for advice. Okay, It's very much a person-to-person, face-to-face role. So that's essentially the three main levels of uh, financial advice practice. Administrators power planners and advisors, right? Now, of course, there's a whole load of satellite roles, things like compliance, um, risk management, all kinds of things, investment uh, expertise, if you're wired that way. But that's the basis. Most of financial advice's practice will have administrators, power planners and advisors. Okay. Now, number four that you need to know, qualifications are actually only a small part of what the job entails. Really important. Usually, advisors are good people people if you see what i mean okay they are personable good at building relationships 
the best advisors have a real knack of pulling together the many threads of a client's personal and financial lives. And they can weave those threads together into a plan to help them achieve their goals. Empathy, obviously, is an essential skill for a successful financial advisor. I think, disappointingly, many advisors are good at feigning empathy to win business, but a truly empathetic advisor will be successful in building really solid, long-lasting client relationships. The ability to listen well is prerequisite, and it really helps if you're a good judge of character. Sometimes, you know, that something comes out... uh, Let me rephrase that. Something that comes with time is the ability to hear what a client is really saying, even if the words coming out of their mouth say something completely different. For instance, it's not unusual to have a client say, yes, I'm happy with this level of risk, say, with my investments. But then in the next breath, they're asking all kinds of questions about short-term performance uh, of their portfolio. And so a good advisor will sort of pick up the subtext very often of what a client is saying and what they're not saying. That's a real skill. Coaching skills are useful, some would say essential, to be a really excellent financial advisor. Building wealth is a long-term process. The advisor-client relationship can last for decades. Coming alongside the client to encourage them to stick to the plans that they've made, not to be diverted by distractions, that's part of the role. It's hard to quantify, hard to put a value on, you know, pounds and pence value, but clients really appreciate that, uh, that level of support very often. Obviously, as I've already said, the ability to communicate is a prerequisite. Sometimes, often, advisors have to explain fairly complex, abstract concepts to clients in such a way that the client feels able to make a decision and actually take action in the present. So while you have to have the exams to understand how the whole personal finance system works, you also need great people skills to make sure that you can apply you know, the finance system to the best advantage of that unique client in that moment, right? So it's an interesting set of skills an advisor needs to have. Before we look at what you need to do, I just want to highlight what I think is the crucial distinction between advice and planning, okay? In one sense, it's just semantics that. Certainly, there are lots of overlaps between the two disciplines, and I believe they are separate. In my mind, financial advice is the process of identifying the best financial product for a given client's current and future needs, right? It's about identifying the best financial product. Financial planning is an overarching process. It's additional, but it informs the advice. It requires establishing a clear picture of the client's current situation, helping them identify and vocalize their goals and their ideal timescales for reaching those goals. Then we need to work out the path to get from here to there in the most tax-efficient, cost-efficient, and time-efficient manner. Only then, only within that framework, can we decide on what a product might be, if at all. Right? Very often, the answer to the solutions to the financial planning challenge are not based in products. Okay? The product, if it's there, is the last link in the chain. It's certainly not the whole point. Sometimes a product doesn't feature at all. In these days of internet disintermediation, the value of financial advice is diminishing, I think, right? People can get pretty much any product themselves, certainly for less money than it would cost them to pay an advisor to essentially broker a product. But I think the value of lifestyle financial planning is only increasing, right? So if I were you, I wouldn't aspire to be a financial advisor. I would aspire to be a financial planner. Your future is likely to be far more secured if you do. Okay, so bearing all that in mind, what do you actually need to do to become a financial advisor? Okay, first thing you need to do is to pick a diploma. Pick a diploma. There's no getting around the fact that you can't become a financial advisor, financial planner, Henceforth, those two terms will be interchangeable, okay? Uh, Just in case of my script, I've kept it as advisor. Um, You can't become a financial advisor planner without becoming qualified. Um, And that means you've got to achieve the minimum of the level four qualification, otherwise known as diploma level. As I mentioned earlier, there are several providers of diploma qualifications. I think that I'm right in saying that most potential employers would prefer to take an advisor with the CII 
Diploma in Regulated Financial Planning. I know I would as an employer, but the others are valid, certainly, but certainly better than nothing, um, way better than nothing, actually. But I like the CII framework. They're all hugely flawed, by the way, but the CII, I think, is the most robust qualification. Um, there's a link in the show notes to that. It's called the CII uh, Diploma in Regulated Financial Planning. So the others are not inferior. I just think before too long, the minimum standard is going to be level six. That's, you know, the chartered financial planner. I think that will become the most recognizable professional mark, chartered financial planner. That title can only be conferred by the CII, Chartered Insurance Institute. So if you achieve your diploma through a provider other than the CII, you might have to sit at least one extra exam before you can even embark on the chartered level exams. So consider the CII route. Uh, it's important that anyone considering being a financial advisor is prepared to continue past diploma level. That's the minimum standard. You need to be prepared to pursue chartered status. Um, might be several years off, but I'm convinced that will become the minimum standard. To put it in perspective, it's possible to gain the diploma uh, within a year, 18 months with some hard work, okay? chartered or the advanced diploma is likely another two to two and a half years of study on top of that all right if you're bright and you've got endless time to study then you could do it quicker than that but that's probably a realistic time frame now long-time listeners will remember that i used to extol the virtues of certified financial planners now that's a different kind of qualification altogether it's no wonder it's confusing is it we've got chartered financial planners certified financial planners it's uh, not helpful, I think. Um, so the Certified Financial Planner License is a very different kind of qualification. It's an internationally recognized standard for financial planning, and it's the only mark that can be legitimately shortened to CFP. So if you see CFP after an advisor's name, you know they're a Certified Financial Planner. And when you, whenever you see that mark, you can be assured that the advisor you're dealing with has been assessed in his or her ability to deliver a truly holistic financial plan. But I have just revoked my certified financial planner license. Is that, perhaps revoked isn't the right word because I haven't had it taken off me. I've just um, given it up, <laughs> right? Why? Well, in short, I believe the chartered financial planner mark carries more weight here in the UK. I think it's more recognizable. I have to pay a lot of money every year to maintain the CFP license, the certified financial planner license, and I just don't see the benefit anymore. Until a few years ago, the UK custodian of the CFP mark was the Institute of Financial Planning. This was subsumed into uh, the Chartered Institute of Securities Investments, the CISI. And in my not so humble opinion, the CISI just hasn't delivered on its promises to maintain, develop and promote the CFP mark in the UK. So I think it's dying. I hope I'm wrong. And if I am, maybe I'll pick it up again. But Right now, I'm uh, sort of throwing my not inconsiderable weight behind the chartered financial planner mark, which I also hold. There's um, a lot greater emphasis now on holistic financial planning within the chartered financial planner qualification route. So having a separate assessment and qualification seems unnecessary. It used to be that chartered advanced diploma, that sort of level, was primarily about exam passing, whereas the CFP was about writing uh, and creating a proper financial plan. Uh, those lines are less distinct than they used to be. There's a lot more of the financial planning in the chartered qualification route now. So uh, I would probably err towards that. Now, if you're a new entrant to this glorious profession, you're going to need to qualify to diploma level uh, pretty quickly. And I would begin work on this before you start approaching potential employers. A good firm will help you to qualify. They will pay and support you through exam sitting. Certainly we do that here at Jackson's with our uh, employees. But if you show willing by embarking on the learning process under your own steam, that can only stand you in good stead with any potential future employer. Okay, so pick your diploma. Personally, I would err towards the CII route, but other routes are available and will serve you well. Second thing you need to do is to pick your discipline. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's fair to say... The world of financial advice is pretty varied, right? While I'm convinced that holistic financial planning is the gold standard in my world, there are financial advice professionals who choose to specialize in particular areas of advice, and that's an equally worthy calling. Um, mortgage advice is a rewarding and challenging career choice. There's a lower barrier to entry to it in terms of qualifications. Um, 
But excellence comes with experience, of course. A mortgage advice, when it's at its best, is far more than being able to just use a computer system to source the right deals. It's about matching borrowers to lenders, and that requires an intimate knowledge of the underwriting requirements of different lenders, potential pitfalls, before an application even begins. It's a specialist area, and there is a real market for it. The same goes for what we'll call protection-only advisors. Um, for example, my friends Catherine and Alan Knowles of a company called Cura, that's C-U-R-A, they are award-winning protection advisors. Catherine uh, is a bit of a kindred spirit because she loves to do video, right? So she's done some excellent videos explaining how you can improve your chances of getting life insurance if you've had various medical conditions or if you are transgender or if you have visited ex uh, exotic countries in the recent past. Things which might potentially be a pitfall and be a bit of a stumbling block if protection advice is not your specialism. These guys have honed their craft so that they know the life insurance market intimately and can help pretty much anybody get life insurance. And that's a specialist knowledge I just can't even begin to understand, all right? So, you know, do some homework. Think about which discipline you might want to focus on. You can always change later on. So, you know, you could begin with mortgage work, for example, and that might refine your client-facing skills. You might either decide that you love it and you want to continue in that, you may decide you want to broaden to include protection advice or move on to, you know, holistic financial planning, taking in the whole gamut, investment pensions, tax advice, all that sort of stuff, right? Whatever. There's plenty of ways you can be a part of this profession. You just need to choose your discipline. Okay, the thing you need to do is to reach out to some local firms. By far the biggest hurdle you're going to find is, is finding an employer willing to take a punt on a brand new untested advisor. If you can... Uh, if you're coming into the industry green, right, you're going to be a pure cost to the business that you're working for until you're up and running and begin earning fees in your own right. Far too many employers still consider financial advice to be a purely sales game, and they think of their advisors just as fee earners. I, I get that. Um, so, But what that means is that if you don't have a ready-made client bank that can produce an income for you, you'll find many employers just won't even consider taking you on. Now, an increasing number of firms, I'm pleased to say, they're establishing really sort of thorough, proper training programs that can take new entrants to the industry and provide them with a career path. The challenge, though, is finding those firms. Now, some will take on people interested in becoming advisors, uh, but start them off in admin roles, right? And that's usually a really good idea, actually, because it helps you to understand the day-to-day -day workings of the financial advice process. Uh, it's a little bit like when you join McDonald's at manager level, you spend weeks on the floor flipping burgers, <laughs> you know, sorting stuff out in the freezer, all the crappy rolls that I used to do at McDonald's, because you need to understand how the business works at its basic sort of grassroots level. And joining a financial advice practice as an administrator will help you to do that. So it's not a bad idea. Now, as you progress, all the while you're sitting more exams, becoming more highly qualified, you might progress to become a power planner, which, as I mentioned, is a worthy goal in itself. It's not just a stepping stone to full advice. Power planners are often more highly qualified than the advisors that they work with, as I said earlier. And you might actually find that you prefer the technical nature of power planning as opposed to the client-facing nature of advising. And a good employer will provide opportunities for you to sit in with advisors, to see them at work, and to see whether that's attractive to you as an option. So how do you find a good local firm? Well, there are comparison websites such as Unbiased, Vouched for, Advisor Book is my particular favorite of those. You can search for a chartered financial planner using the CII directory. Uh, certified financial planners you can find on a website called Wayfinder. There's links to all those in the show notes. And then you just need to reach out, right? Ask to speak to one of the directors. Say you are interested in becoming an advisor and ask them for help. Most advisors, most business owners will be happy to give you five or ten minutes on the phone to help you further your career, right? And you never know, one of them might offer you some work experience or even an interview, who knows? You've got to get out there and try, though. If you're drawn towards the financial planning side of advice, I would urge you to get to know the guys at Next Gen Planners. Um, they're doing some great work equipping and encouraging an up-and-coming generation of financial planning professionals. Again, link to Next Gen Planners in the notes. So reach out to local firms. Fourth thing you need to do is to prepare for a pay cut. Many of you anyway. 
I get quite a few emails from, say, 20-year veteran professionals like engineers, project management specialists, people who have achieved a certain level in their chosen profession but who feel a call towards a career change, towards financial planning. Now, there is no way you're going to shift from 20 years of experience in one profession to zero experience in another and expect to maintain the same salary, right? If you think that, probably you're not going to be a financial advisor, clues in the name, <laughs> right? It's hard, if not impossible, really, for me to suggest salary levels for administrators, power planners, and financial advisors. There's just too many regional and professional variations to make it meaningful. Um, a senior power planner in a London wealth management firm might earn 60 grand a year or more. Someone doing the same job in Cornwall might earn 25 grand a year. All right, so it's massive differences. A financial advisor who is paid a proportion of the fees that she generates potentially has no upper limit on her earnings. And if you end up owning your own financial advice firm, then the sky's the limit. Although, speaking personally, I am a long way from the sky. <laughs> um, if you're serious, though, about becoming a financial advisor, and if by doing so you will take a pay cut, then you're going to need to be prepared. So you're going to need to get used to living on a lower income. So budget carefully. Salt away some reserves that you can draw from while you are building back up. In other words, you need to plan financially to become a financial planner. Kind of poetic, right? But fairly obvious if you think about it. So be prepared for a pay cut. Um, it is worth it, though. And it is a well-paid profession. Okay, so the future is bright, but it can take some time to build up. One last piece of advice, which is a little bit left field, because we're 35 minutes in here. The financial advice profession is still not trusted as a whole, and not without good reason. I'm doing my bit to try and uh, fix that, but, you know, it's understandable. We haven't exactly covered ourselves in glory in the past. And so people might ask you, you know, why do you want to become a financial advisor, right? They're just possibly one step above a Bieber's and estate agents, right? So, you know, you're not going to need to provide an answer to that question. So why not document your journey? If you're committed to becoming an advisor, then why not document the journey as you go along? So consider writing blog posts, maybe, about the decisions you make, the experiences you have as you study, as you gain experience, as you make mistakes, and as you celebrate victories. As you learn and progress, you're going to gain insights into the industry and into the human psyche, which will serve you very well in your new future. But others could benefit from that too. So document your journey. If you don't like writing, start a podcast, okay, or a video series. And um, believe me, you'll never be short of things to say, to write or to talk about. And the learning process will actually be compelling reading, viewing or listening for other people, watching you learn and grow. You might think who would want to watch that, but you'd be surprised, okay? As your career develops, you're going to be able to point people towards this material that you've created as you've learned. And in doing so, you will engender trust in you and in your burgeoning expertise. You could build an audience which could then become clients. I am living proof that that is possible and that it works. One of my internet heroes, a guy called Gary Vaynerchuk, I wonder if maybe one day I might get him on this show. Unlikely, <laughs> but you never know. But Gary says he sort of encourages people to document, don't create. Document, don't create. In other words, share your story of your development rather than just thinking of abstract stuff to talk about. People identify with stories and they will warm to your story. And there is nothing like consistent, honest sharing of your journey to win people to your cause. So consider documenting your journey as you become a financial advisor. A little bit of a left field piece of advice. So I am bound to have missed stuff uh, out of this, but I think I've got down everything that I wanted to, to get down. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'll update this post as developments happen. It'll become like a pillar piece of post on how to become a financial advisor, a piece of post, a piece of content on how to become an advisor. But as things change and develop, I'll update the post. Now, the entire transcript of this episode is going to be in plain text on the blog post, so you can read it, right? And then you can return to it without having to sort of hand over your email address for the transcript as, you, as I normally make you do. Um, maybe bookmark it. If you're serious about becoming a financial advisor, easy link to remember, meaningfulmoney.tv slash session 316. Um, but look, if I can help you 
to pursue a dream to become a financial advisor or financial planner, then just get in touch via the website. Okay. Cool. Oh, that was helpful. That was fun. Nearly 40 minutes. Uh, and 3,660 words if you're interested. So next week, I'm uh, chatting with a gentleman called Lars Croyer, and he is the author of the excellent book, Investing Demystified. Fantastic book. Uh, uh, friend and listener to the show, Matt P, has put me in touch with Lars, and uh, I'm going to be interviewing Lars, and uh, that's going to be coming out next week. Um, so I haven't spoken to him yet, but I know it's going to be a great conversation because his book is excellent. Um so if you haven't read it already, then do that and then listen to me uh, uh, chat with Lars next week. I'm really looking forward to that. Uh, just to dig deep into investing, which is a subject important to us all. And that's it, folks. So I'm, just, I'm experimenting a little bit. I have a new piece of equipment, which is making the audio quality on the sound effects better. These things make me happy. All right, so... Uh, if I've missed anything or if you've got any questions or whatever, meaningfulmoney.tv slash session316 is where this post will live. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope it was useful. Thanks so much for listening and I'll talk to you next time.